Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the university on a cold night with our weathermen threatening that there'll be snow, at least in some parts of the country. So who knows by the time we're finished where the snow will fall. Pro-Chancellor and guests from other universities, uh, our colleagues across the university, and especially um, the, the family of Professor Shakespeare were with us today his wife and his parents-in-law, special welcome. And uh, we remember, of course, his dear mom who can't be with us, but is uh, quite old, and uh, I'm sure we are all in her thoughts as well, um, um, Stephen. These moments where we stop to celebrate our new professors are very important in the life of the university. And I'm especially delighted that um, this year we have a rich crop of homegrown professors. These are people, young, who came to us when they were much younger, and some 10, <laughs> 10 or 20 years later have passed the test of being our professors. And I, I can tell you that we don't do this lightly or hastily, and we're absolutely sure that the people who have, who bear the title professor here, will be professors at the best places. And our speaker this evening is one of those who, um, I'm delighted to say, Stephen, I remember the day you were made our chaplain and remember your first major text and then the rich crop of publications that came after that. So we do stop to celebrate an important moment in the life of not just one scholar, but in the life of the university. So welcome, everybody. I'm looking forward to this lecture. And I'm going to invite um, the Pro Vice Chancellor, Professor Naga, to introduce our speaker, Professor Naga. Vice Chancellor, colleagues, uh, distinguished guests, friends, and family of Professor Shakespeare, may I also extend my own welcome to you to this inaugural lecture tonight. This is the second one in the inaugural lecture series for the current academic year. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity this evening to introduce our new professor, and therefore our inaugural lecturer Professor Stephen Shakespeare, who holds a personal chair in continental philosophy of religion within the School of Humanities at this university. Professor Shakespeare was born and grew up in Walsall in the, in, in the West Midlands, and he was the first in his family to go to university. He graduated with a first class honors degree in theology and religious studies from the University of Cambridge. And then he completed his PhD on the philosopher Kierkegaard from the same university in the year 1994. And his thesis was supervised by Professor George Pattison. Professor Shakespeare was ordained as deacon in the Church of England in the year 1996 and subsequently as a priest in the year 1997. He published his first research monograph, drawing on the work of his doctoral thesis in the year 2001. Uh, he came to Liverpool Hope as the Anglican chaplain in the year 2003, and in 2008, he became a lecturer in the then recently established area of philosophy at this university and uh, he played an important role uh, to promote the, the, the subject uh, at undergraduate and postgraduate levels. With his colleagues, Dr. Patrice Hines and Dr. Duane Williams, he established the Association for Continental Philosophy of Religion, which has organized five international conferences and many other events. The association has also supported two book series of which Professor Shakespeare has been co-series editor. Um, and the current series entitled Reframing Continental Philosophy of Religion is published 
through Roman and Littlefield publishers. Professor Shakespeare's own um, noteworthy work has included four uh, major research monographs, two on Kierkegaard, one on Derrida, and another one on the theology of radical orthodoxy. He has edited three volumes and uh, co-edited a book on popular theology and has published numerous essays and journal articles. His next major publications are two further edited volumes, including a fast script in the honor of his doctoral supervisor, Professor George Pattison. And uh, this, uh, this volume, this is a volume that uh, he has, Professor Shakespeare has co-edited with Professor Claire Carlyle, and it is due to come out in published form uh, around May time this year. And of course, I'm delighted to say that both uh, Professor Pattison and uh, Professor Carlyle are uh, present here in, in the audience today. Professor Shakespeare has also become known as a writer of liturgy and prayer uh, through his work such as Prayers for an Inclusive Church which was published in the year 2009, and another work entitled The Earth Cries Glory, Daily Prayer with Creation, published in the year 2019. His collection of prayer poems for the Christian year, entitled Come Holy Gift, is being published by Canterbury Press, imminently, and I understand it is due to come out either the end of this month or, or, or um, uh, early next month in March. Alongside his ongoing research on philosophies of creation and nature and the theology of Mary, he is taking an MA in creative writing at Manchester Metropolitan University. As an Anglican priest, he regularly preaches and presides in the team parish of St. Luke in the city, as well as for, uh, for Eucharists run by uh, our own university's chaplaincy team here. He is a member of the Sodality of Mary, a dispersed community of priests in the Anglo-Catholic tradition. He is a fellow of the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics and a patron of the, Ang of the Anglican Society for Welfare of Animals. And so, it is a genuine delight and joy for me to invite Professor Shakespeare, our professor of continental philosophy of religion, to deliver to us his inaugural lecture entitled, Romancing Nature, Philosophy of Religion in an Age of Ecological Crisis. Mr. Shakespeare. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm very honored to be here before you. Uh, Vice Chancellor, members of HOPE's Senior Management and Governing Council, uh, invited guests, family and friends, and uh, particularly pleased to welcome some of my students here. Um, don't worry, it's not on the exam. Um, thank you very much for that, for that lovely and generous uh, introduction, Professor Nagar, and thank you to all those who worked very hard to, to make this kind of event possible. I'm particularly grateful to the staff in the School of Humanities office, uh, especially to, to Faye Sinclair, who has had to field my many dozens of irritating emails. Um, it is much appreciated. I'm very humbled by uh, your giving up a, a night on which Liverpool are playing Leeds, um, and <laughs> very humbled that you've spent the time to, to be here, uh, especially those who've traveled a long way um, family, friends, Professor Patterson, Professor Carlyle. Um, I, am, I am feeling a little exposed, my doctoral supervisor standing here, but then to be a professor, I suppose, means to speak publicly, literally, to declare openly. And I think it's important for the university uh, as a whole to engage with the world. 
and to keep alive those questions of truth and value. Govern government policy, if I may mention it, may sometimes wish to turn us, our research and our students into outputs with everything priced and quantified, but we should not surrender our common profession. It speaks to the truth that human life is more than the sum of its measurements. But before I get on with the business of professing, let me offer a confession. I confess that I am a romantic. I have always been a romantic. Now my wife Sally's here tonight and she, <laughs> she might, might have a slightly different view of this, but let me explain what I mean before my confession gets me into too much trouble. We use the word romantic today in a very narrow sense. Romantic relationships, romantic comedies are all about interpersonal love, usually between couples. In the 19th century, it had a much broader range. Romantic art and literature and romantic philosophy pushed back against an overly mechanical, analytical and rationalistic view of the world, all of which were the legacy of 18th century science, philosophy and the effects of industrialization. These romantic figures and movements are complex, but I think they share something in common, and it's this. What defines nature is not mechanism, but life, and life is more than the sum of its parts. Nature is a living, interconnected whole, and can only be truly known and encountered by a living subject. Nature is not known merely by detached mind and measurement, but with all the resources of the spirit, imagination, emotion, creative expression. We may think of philosophy as a game played in the ether of the mind, but for the romantics, it is a loving, embodied knowing which delights in the world. As the great German romantic poet and thinker Novalis puts it, in the most authentic sense, philosophizing is a caress, testimony of the most intense love of meditation, absolute pleasure in wisdom. The Romantics pick up an older strain of philosophical wisdom, which argues that to know nature is to be in union with it while also realizing we never fully grasp it. Nature defies being controlled and con co captured and controlled. It is excessive. Our experience of nature can only hint at this in a series of brilliant fragments, all interconnected, but none of them offering a systematic God's eye viewpoint on the whole. It's in this sense that I've always been a romantic before I knew anything about philosophy. What fascinates and compels me are fragments, shards of experience which glow with an intensity, an inner life which beckons me to a threshold onto something unfathomable but whole. Still, while that might help clarify what I mean by being a romantic, it may not get me much respect as a philosopher or a thinker in general. Romanticism might be associated with great poetry and music, but philosophy? Isn't romanticism just a bit too away with the fairies, nymphs, and dryads to be any use to rigorous thought and logic? Romantics seem to put vague notions derived from the imagination and intuition before clear distinctions or empirical proof. Where they do engage with science, they are, from our point of view, hopelessly out of date. Grandiose and pretentious, the romantics are best left in the philosophical footnotes of history. I disagree entirely with this assessment. Grandiose and pretentious, sounds good to me. I am a romantic after all. But in all seriousness, the marginalization of romanticism in philosophy is flawed, and scholarship is now better appreciating the philosophical commitments and subtleties of romantic thinkers such as Novalis, Schlegel, and Schelling. And I'm especially indebted to the work of scholars such as Alison Stone, Susanna Lindbergh, David Krell, and Dahlia Nassar. Romantic thought in the early 19th century shapes everything that follows, from idealist and Marxist thought to many of our contemporary debates about the relationship between art and reality between science and faith, questions of gender, embodiment, and identity, and of course, our place in nature. But this isn't just, for me, a question of historical influence. 
the Romantics can help us. They shed crucial light on our own ecological dilemmas. They challenge our overly dualistic, individualistic, instrumental, consumerist, and denatured ways of living and thinking. Romantic thought rekindles the ancient insight that philosophy is about a way of life and not just a set of intellectual tools. It can speak to us because the breakdown in our relationship with nature is not just a problem of policy, technology, or investment. It is all of those, absolutely. But the issue goes deeper, into the roots of how we inhabit the world, our fundamental view of ourselves and what nature is. It is broadly a spiritual issue, by which I mean it concerns our capacity for wonder, our capacity to encounter and love what is genuinely other. In that sense, the spiritual is also inseparable from the political, the scientific, and all the issues of power relationships and colonialism which feed our current ecological breakdowns. And this is precisely why the Romantics offer something to us, not cheap solutions, but an invitation to inhabit the world differently, to see ourselves as expressions of nature, not as nature's rulers. As I've indicated, romanticism is one of those terms it's hard to pin down. My own focus is going to be on the German romantics, uh, writing around the turn of the 19th century, and particularly their understanding of nature. This was a period in which the likes of Novalis, Friedrich August and Carolina Schlegel, Friedrich Schelling, Dorothea Weidt, and Friedrich Schleiermacher were the epicenter of an incredible ferment of literary activity, journal publishing, and collaboration in the cities of Jena and Berlin. Although associated with literature and poetry in particular at first, the concerns of this group were far wider than any specific genre of writing. And one way of understanding the development of their perspective is through the work of the philosopher and poet Friedrich Schlegel. After an initial dissatisfaction with the literature of his day, which he felt fell short of classical models, Schlegel identified a positive potential in it. He named this the Romantic, a word which echoes the Romance literature of the Middle Ages, as well as the emerging genre of the novel, Die Roman, in German. But Schlegel's use of the term points beyond any specific form or genre. Romantic poetry, he argues, is, to quote him, progressive universal poetry. In a certain sense, all poetry is, or should be, romantic. Its best exemplar for him is actually the modern novel, with its ability to combine genres and perspectives. So what characterizes romantic poetry in this sense? It certainly involves an attempt to overcome boundaries between poetry and prose, for example, between art and nature, between imagination and knowledge. I suggest that what lies beneath the celebration of poetry is a romantic idea of reality, indeed a romantic idea of the absolute, of unconditioned reality, as it is expressed in nature and in our own creativity. Now, as soon as a philosopher starts talking about the absolute, we might need to reach for the paracetamol, but bear with me. Let me try and build this up in stages. So first, we'll explore the romantics' diagnosis of what was wrong with the dominant ways of thinking in their age. Second, we'll consider why they were drawn to the idea of an absolute reality and how we should relate to that. And then I'll look finally at how we might see this as relevant to our own ecological problems. So I begin with the romantic diagnosis of our divided world and lifeless nature. According to the scholar Frederick Beiser, the romantics hoped to restore the beauty, magic, and mystery of nature in the aftermath of the ravages of science and technology. In her reading of Schlegel's understanding of nature, Alison Stone also picks up on the element of magic. Schlegel's aim is to reject the idea of a disenchanted, merely mechanical nature. For Schlegel, Stone writes, humans would enchant nature by perceiving it as partly mysterious, not fully rationally comprehensible. I think it's important to understand this kind of statement because some of the statements made by romantics like Novalis and Schlegel seem to suggest that we enchant or romanticize nature just by looking at it differently, casting a poetic veil over it, a grand version of looking at the world through rose-tinted spectacles. 
But this does not get to the root of the story. Yes, of course, the productive imagination plays its part in transforming nature for them as for all romantics. But this is only because imagination and poetry are themselves expressions of nature. Nature is not known as a cold and detached object standing over against us, but as an unfolding, dynamic life expressed in and through us. Key to this is the sense that nature's own life is creative metamorphosis and productive expression. So it's important that the romantics are not asking us to get lost in fantasies of our own creation. They are inviting us to participate in nature's own self-creation and self-expression. And this is a position which I think rests on serious philosophical reasoning. The Romantics argued that the philosophy and science of the 18th century, at least that which was dominant, left a damaging legacy. It presented a dualistic view of the world, which separated mind from body, reason from imagination, thoughts from feeling. In response, the Romantics argued we needed to integrate our understanding of reality. They claimed that our sense of the world will be fundamentally shaped by the rules we impose upon perception and knowledge. If I say I will only accept as evidence for reality what is material, empirical, and quantifiable, then I will dictate in advance the kind of reality I will find. And that will limit what I am able to encounter. It will cut me off from the potential to encounter anything which transcends those limited categories of knowing and perception. I will find what I set out to find and nothing more. For the Romantics, then, the success of modern science and technology had come with a price, and that was the elevation of one method of thinking above all, analysis. Analysis, in this sense, means breaking something down into its component parts in order to understand it. Of course, this can be a useful tool. The problem comes when it becomes our only method of understanding things. The Romantics argued that analysis failed when it came to understanding complex living wholes, such as organisms or works of art. Friedrich Schlegel, for example, writes that the isolating understanding begins by dividing and dismembering the whole of nature. And the violence implicit in that language is not accidental. Analyzed reality is dissected reality, torn into isolated and lifeless elements. We lose a sense of the whole being more than the sum of its parts. Exclusively analytical methods go hand in hand with a dogmatically mechanical interpretation of how the world works. The world as machine is a world free of any value but efficiency, in which instrumental levers of power alone dictate the outcomes. Ideas of beauty, freedom, and moral value begin to look nothing more than subjective fantasies, the froth on the top of those chemical reactions which are really all that there is. The Romantics reject this view. Their basic contention is that we tend to separate what in life belongs together. They critique a purely mechanical philosophy as itself a fantasy a projection of a one-dimensional model on all of nature, which ignores the crucial fact that our own creative thought is part of nature. To do justice to both our thinking and to nature, we need to overcome this divided mentality. This is why Novalis refuses any ultimate division between philosophy and poetry. Rational investigation into logic and truth is inseparable from the creative re-expression of nature's processes of becoming. As he states, the separation into poet and thinker is to the disadvantage of both. It is a sign of sickness. A philosopher who uses analysis alone is a one-trick pony, trapped in a prison of blinkered perception. It's only by becoming more varied and universal that the philosopher is able to raise herself up to the level of poetry. If, to quote Novalis again, the diversity of the methods increases, the thinker eventually knows how to make everything out of each thing. The philosopher becomes a poet. The poet is but the highest degree of the thinker. For Novalis then, the poet is in turn a witness to a higher life with an almost priestly ministry of mediation, 
as Schlegel puts it, the romantic poem contains a hint of something higher, the infinite, a hieroglyph of the sacred fullness of a creative nature. Now remember again that poetry here is not limited to poetic verse, although it includes it. The romantic conception of poetry, I suggest, points to a stance, a quality of attention and engagement and creative entanglement in and with nature. I think this helps to make sense of Novalis' famous statement from 1798, where he says, the world must be romanticized. This yields again its original meaning. By giving the common a higher meaning, the everyday a mysterious semblance, the known, the dignity of the unknown, the finite, the appearance of the infinite, I romanticize it. For Novalis to romanticize the world is to raise it to a higher power, to see in the everyday and finite a partial expression of the infinite. But this is not pure invention. We are reconnecting with the world's original meaning, discovering something, not making it up. We do this by sharing in nature's own infinite, restless capacity for expression and change. This is why Schlegel thought the ideal image of the philosopher was the plant, rooted, absorbing nutrients, and in response, unfolding and transforming its being in the world. So the Romantics were convinced that a truly adequate philosophy of nature was both realist and idealist. Realist because it accepted nature comes before us, has a life and reality, a wildness, not subject to our petty concerns and projects. Idealist because nature always seeks to express itself and so blossoms in our own consciousness and creativity, in the ideas and works through which we connect with and transform the world around us. Romanticism is a realism. It responds appropriately to what is real and does not box it into dead categories of mechanism or materialism. So we're already seeing how this diagnosis of the ills of Western culture leads to a re-evaluation of nature and how we stand in relation to it. But to really do justice to this, we need to think about how the Romantics thought of the fundamental nature of reality and why they were drawn to the notion of gulp an absolute. Romantic philosophy was hugely influenced by the thought of Immanuel Kant. This may be surprising because Kant has the reputation, perhaps unfairly, of being one of the most boring of the great philosophers whose daily walks in Königsberg were so regular you could set your clock by them. But I want to pick out two elements of Kant's work which had a profound impact on Romanticism. The first was the idea of the unconditioned. Basically, Kant argues that reason tries to explain things in the world in terms of their conditions, the limiting factors and causes which make things what they are and not something else. But Kant thought our reason could never be satisfied by partial explanations. It wanted to push further and further until it could arrive at a reality which grounded everything else and which needed no further explanation itself. This could only be something unconditioned, without limit. Our minds, for Kant, are almost hardwired to seek out the unconditioned, the absolute. But Kant also argued that this unconditioned must remain forever beyond us, because our knowledge could only truly grasp things that we could experience. The unconditioned could never be the object of a possible experience. So it remained an out-of-reach ideal for Kant, a guiding star, not something we could ever encounter or know. The Romantics disagreed. They argued that, yes, we do have this burning passion for the absolute, but that we could also indirectly know it and experience it, not using our limited concepts, but using our whole embodied knowing perception, which they called intuition. Intuition would connect us to the infinite. Kant had neglected this, giving us only a partial account of knowledge, leaving us still divided from reality. The second of Kant's legacies is the role he gives to the organism. 
When it came to understanding the physical world, Kant initially argued we need to see it in terms of Newtonian physics as mechanical. But when he looked at natural organisms, he realized this wasn't going to work. An organism is not just a machine which has to be given its directions and force from the outside. An organism is both organized, and that means it has every part functioning in terms of a greater whole, and to all appearances, purposive. It senses itself. It lives by internalizing its perception of the world and its nutrients, not merely by reacting to external causes. Again, Kant didn't think we could ever know the organism wasn't just a machine, but he was certainly pointing in that direction, and the romantics took this further. For them, the organism becomes the basic model for nature as a whole. A mechanical analysis of an organism fails to do justice to its living principle, its organized life in relation to itself and its world. So let's connect these two things, the unconditioned absolute and the organism. It becomes clear that for the Romantics, an adequate concept of nature was an organic one. Nature is productive and purposive life. The living organism itself is a finite expression of the whole, a sign of the absolute. One of the attractions of the organic model of philosophy, or the organic model of nature, is that it overcomes the dualisms of philosophy. The organism is both physical and free, material yet animate. It internally relates to itself while also seeing and internalizing its world. Against the idea that all order and organization are the opposite of freedom, the organism shows that each needs the other to be what it is. But this is not the end of the story. The philosopher Friedrich Schelling was a key part of romantic circles in these years, putting forward an essentially animated view of, the, of, of nature as alive. He argued for the centrality of the organic principle in nature as a way of challenging our sense of separation and human detachment. What appears as outside us, a non-human nature set over against us and over against human spirit and culture, is in fact the symbol of the inner life which we share, of which we are the fruit. But Schelling went further. He was fascinated by the attempts of contemporary scientists to identify the fundamental driving forces within the organic and within nature. In his philosophy of nature from around the turn of the 19th century, he identifies two of these forces as key drivers of life, excitability and irritability. They are certainly the main characteristics of our house when we try and get the kids to school in the morning. But what did he mean by them? Excitability and irritability. Well, excitability is the capacity something has to be affected, to be moved, to sense. Irritability is the capacity a thing has to affect others, to cause ripples in its environment. These basic forces are in tension, but they are inseparable from one another. Just as my capacity to touch something other than me is only possible if I am capable of feeling touched by it. Nature, therefore, for Schelling, is not a dead object or collections of objects, but in Schelling's words, unconditioned productivity. There is a constant ebb and flow in nature of expansion and growth and metamorphosis, settling into individual forms which persist and hold out against death, but only for a time. In this view of nature, as much as it is defined by life, this is a life in which Decay, contagion, and death play an essential role. Individual expressions of nature are always becoming, never static, and their life is essentially bound up with their vulnerability and mortality. Poetry and nature both emerge from and keep step with the original chaos of nature, this tension of forces. So the romantic conception of nature is looking a little less rosy now and all the better for it. It's philosophically serious, arguing we need to transform our idea of nature, but also our stance towards nature. This is a philosophy in which there can be no absolute division between mind and matter, human and non-human, poetry and thought. 
It's a realism which accepts the restlessness, ambiguity, and decay that are inherent in nature's expressions. But it also asks us to take seriously the fundamental questions of nature's infinite and unconditioned grounds without ever losing sight of each singular living thing in its beauty, vulnerability, and decay. In fact, Romanticism is not at all opposed to science, but only to a certain conception of scientism, a dogma about what counts as real. In fact, the Romantics took a lively interest in the science of their day, including new discoveries in magnetism and electricity. Novalis himself trained as a mining engineer, which included formal study of geology and other physical scientists, sciences. While, of course, some of their scientific theorizing looks out of date, their approach is not. They see science as rich with its own form of philosophical thinking, unfolding the fundamental expressive forces of nature. And in, in, in turn, Schlegel sees poetry as a kind of chemistry, and further argued that if one wants to penetrate the inside of physics, then one must be initiated into the mysteries of poetry. Again, poetry is held up as important because it is this chemical, alchemical transformation of elements, as much magical as physical, a transmutation of experience which grows out of the material of nature itself. Poetry saves philosophy and thought from becoming trapped in the abstract. So as Dalia Nassar argues, the romantic idea of nature is both metaphysical and epistemological. In other words, the question of what there is and how we know it cannot be separated. We know by loving attention and participation. We know by recognizing the finite and limited as, having, as being a living expression of the infinite. For all the romantic, sometimes troubled relationships with Christianity, this is essentially a sacramental, incarnational understanding of nature. As Novalis puts it, the sensible must be presented as spiritual and the spiritual as sensible. And as Schlegel says, all thinking is divination. And this is possible because even our language is more than just a representation of things or a projection of our own imaginings. It is a participation in the essential nature of things. Language, says Novalis, is an expression of spirit whose words must be accompanied at every step by a receptive stillness. To use Orion Edgar's phrase from another context, nature is on both sides of our perception. To know the productive, dynamic, and expressive ground of who we are we ourselves must embrace an embodied form of perception. What we objectify, we kill. And in killing nature, we are killing the heart of our own life too. So we thought about the romantic diagnosis of our dividedness. We've looked at how they respond to this with a new conception of nature and how we relate to it. And in the next section, I want to raise the question of what we can learn from this today. I obviously believe that Romanticism offers something essential to renewing our sense of nature. However, we need to take care. When misunderstood, Romanticism can easily become a one-sided, unreal fantasy or nostalgia, particularly with regard to nature. One focal point for such imaginings and yearnings is the idea of the wild. There's been a slew of books in recent years which in various ways celebrate wildness. Some are impassioned and valuable pleas to protect or enhance our existing or remaining wilderness spaces. And yet one can get the impression that wildness is sometimes acting as a kind of projection of our unfulfilled lack. Just as classically John Berger argues, zoos try to compensate for the disappearance of animals from our lives and worlds. The problem is that such compensations inevitably disappoint, turning the animals and the wild into tokens, spectacles, objects of a human gaze that marginalizes them from their own world and being. So naivety can be a problem, 
but there are darker fringes to the environmental movement too. Schools of thought such as deep ecology offer a welcome affirmation of the holistic conception of nature. However, there is a strand in such thinking which places much of the blame for ecological crises on overpopulation. Whatever the legitimate questions to be asked about population impacts, this kind of discourse can easily obscure questions of inequality, power, and access to resources. It blames the breeding poor for creating an ecological mess, which has in fact been historically driven by richer industrialized nations. Dubious ideas of natural balance are invoked to promote policies of population restriction or worse, and the racist colonial undertones of this are not far from the surface. Take the notorious example of David Foreman, one of the founders of the radical Earth First group, who reacted to the Ethiopian famine of the 1980s by proposing that no aid should be sent, but rather that we should let nature seek its own balance. And it shouldn't surprise us that there is always a further extreme. The eco-fascism inspired by Nazi appeals to the sacredness of blood and soil, whose romanticism, if we can call it that, is rigidly nativist and viciously hostile to immigration. Of course, you can say these are extremes, but they highlight a philosophically dubious move, which is to pit human against nature in a zero-sum game. The more human activity, the less nature can thrive. On this view, human freedom and thriving can only come at the expense of nature. I think this is in part due to the fact that we live in an age obsessed with consumer choice, and we therefore have a very thin view of freedom. We're most free, we're told, when no one and nothing is limiting us, when we depend on nothing, effectively when we're cut off from everything, making our own choices without references to anything else. Well, that's not only a very lonely idea of freedom, it's a false one. And it's here that a more careful reading of Romanticism can help. The Romantics never simply oppose nature and human agency or freedom. The two are entangled, one, the expression and flowering of the other. Yes, human agency can be and often is destructive when it serves a divided and oppositional view of the world or when it reduces nature to raw material. But it is also redemptive, responsive and transformative, enabling of new possibilities of natural growth and expression. True freedom is growth in mutual creativity, for which the isolated and possessive ego needs to be knocked off its throne. For all they yearn for an absolute, the Romantics are clear about the need for human modesty. We are not gods. As Novalis puts it, everywhere we seek the unconditioned and find only things. The German's much better. Wir suchen überall das Unbedingte, und finden immer nur Dinge. The unconditioned, or the absolute, is literally the unbedingter, the unthinged, that which cannot be defined, objectified, and possessed, that which is no thing. So our creative action must go by way of dispossession, surrendering our longing to build systems of knowledge and control. We must turn to a fragmented approach. Schlegel argued strongly that philosophy must be a series of fragments, not a commanding and all-encompassing system, because the absolute is expressed in fragments, known, touched, caressed in these intensities of experience. In what Schlegel calls the artfully ordered confusion of poetry, in our presence to the complex interweavings of natural phenomenon, the absolute comes to expression. I would love there to be more artfully ordered confusion in philosophy and in gardens, actually. We were talking about this earlier uh, today, about how so much of our thinking about gardens is about imposing upon the outside world an extension of our inner domestic space. Gardens as rooms outdoors, not an interface with the other and with the wild. Our artfully ordered confusion comes to expression 
in these limited fragments of reality, but which are always interconnected with one another. So our knowledge is always touching on the absolute, but it's never complete. No perspective can just grasp the absolute as a whole. So I think it's important to remember that for the romantics, the absolute, which may sound very impressive, is not a crushing weight or an amorphous soup which dissolves all our differences, but the matrix within which all differences are related. And poetry is our tracing of and dwelling within that matrix. And it shares its spirit with all our different ways of giving loving attention to nature. That creative attention and intuition is itself a work of nature, allowing the primordial poetry of nature to find a voice. Seen in this light, romanticism can shed light on our current ecological anxieties and concerns. A case in point is the rewilding movement, which is starting to play a bigger role in the management of landscapes in the UK and across the world. Rewilding is a controversial movement because of the way it critiques traditional agricultural land management. Last year, the organization Rewilding Britain had to withdraw from a major project connecting the mountains to the coast in mid Wales. One reason for this was that George Monbiot, a leading light in the rewilding movement, portrayed sheep farming as the equivalent of a plague on the land. This didn't win many friends in the farming communities of Wales, who were key partners in the project. Well, of course, there are perfectly valid critiques of contemporary agriculture, especially where the big concerns turn the countryside into a series of arid monocultures. But there is a balance to be struck, a recognition that farmers and farming are part of the human transformation of the land and can possess a much needed wisdom as more connected, diverse and sustainable practices are developed. That balance between natural, natural processes and human creativity is actually essential to rewilding itself. Take the now fairly well-known example of the, of the Nepp Estate in Sussex. Nepp Estate is owned by Charlie Burrell and Isabella Tree, handed down to Charlie Burrell's family. It's difficult farming terrain, heavy clay sitting over limestone. After struggling for years to sustain farming on the land, in 2000, Burrell and Tree faced failure. The dairy herd was sold and the arable fields rented out. Now that could have been the end of the story, but in 2002, they tried a new approach, allowing natural processes to take a lead in restoring biodiverse habitats. On the one hand, this kind of rewilding, as it's come to be called, means taking a step back, not, in, not intervening, for example, when invasive species seem to be taking a dominant hold allowing scrub to form and spread, letting the dreaded ragwort flourish. But it would be totally wrong to imply that this is not a managed process. What Tree and Burrell aimed to do was to intervene appropriately to restore a lost ecosystem, one which uses large grazing animals as a key element. They're inspired by ecological work which has called into question the idea the eight, that the ancient pre-agricultural landscape of Europe was all densely wooded. Evidence now suggests the landscape was actually a mixed economy of open grass and scrub alongside woodland. And the larger grazing animals are essential to this. They intervene in the land. They clear space for scrub to grow, for larger trees to grow within the protection afforded by the scrub, affecting the whole development of landscapes and watercourses. Grazing animals act as a force of disturbance, re-expressing nature, keeping the landscape dynamic, opening niches for a vast variety of species. And of course, NEP is a human experiment. Funding has to be found to fence it off and prevent animals roaming beyond its borders. The animals themselves have to be introduced, longhorn cattle, Exmoor ponies, Tamworth pigs, roe, fallow, and red deer. Visitors are encouraged, but also managed. So rewilding, when we really look at it, is not simply about a total absence of human interaction, nor is it about reversing time and going back to how things were in some past golden age. But positively, it's about learning 
from ancient mixed ecosystems. Before the human obsession for industrial farming and monocultures took hold. And it does mean, outside the grazing animals and restored water systems, a radical reduction of human-led control, allowing, as I've said, invasive species to spread, allowing trees to stay where they fall, allowing and holding back sometimes from reintroducing species to see what turns up. The result has been an explosion of wildlife in just 17, or actually 19 years, I think now. NEP now has more purple emperor butterflies than anywhere in the UK. Bird species, including nightjars, nightingales, and turtle doves, are established. All five British owl species are present, along with 13 out of the 17 British breeding bat species. More important than considering each species in isolation, however, is the way that allowing the landscape to a large degree to look after itself has, the complex has allowed that complex interrelationship between herbivores, birds, insects, water, land, plant species, and more to take root. It's enabled biodiversity to explode. These really are networks of life, creative, dynamic, and expressive. There are important lessons to be learned here. A realistic hope that the dead hand of modern intensive industrialized farming and fragmented urban development could be lifted, and how quickly biodiversity can expand when we do that. But there are also wider, more philosophical lessons. First, that nature is not a static system of perfect equilibrium, but a shifting web with open and frayed edges. Nature is both resilience and creativity an irrepressible openness to possibility. Human inevit humanity inevitably has a major impact on other species, habitats, and as we know to our cost, the climate as a whole. But human agency does not need to be demonized or negated. It can be redirected through practices of patience, attention, and delight. Rather than the boring and destructive monologue of human control, we can, quite literally, let a hundred flowers bloom. And I think the romantics would approve and push us to think this through. They too wish to overcome the negative opposition of human culture to natural wildness. Human agency, creative imagination, and science are integral to nature's own self-expression. Now, I'm not saying that rewilding is beyond critique, and certainly the mistakes have been made. It's not the answer to everything. But it's a living work in progress, open to critique, open to experimentation, open to development. And in that, it shares something in common with the ongoing work of art. I need to start coming to a close. And yet, you might be saying, he's supposed to be a philosopher of religion. Where's the religion in all of this? Well, I would say it's there and that it has been all along. The way we do philosophy of religion is often as much a symptom of our divided mindset as anything else. In the standard curricula, we investigate this thing called theism, a kind of abstract belief in a transcendent deity that virtually no one actually holds. This deity seems a rather poor shell of a thing, disconnected from embodied nature and knowing. And there have always been those troubling voices in and around the edges of philosophy of religion, the Kierkegaards and Wittgensteins, the Grace Janssens and other feminist philosophers of religion, who've asked us to stop living in our castles in the air and let our philosophy of religion take flesh and life and passion. In that, at least, they echo the challenge of Catholic Christian orthodoxy, that we are judged and saved by God incarnate, that faith is empty without its expression in worship, signs, love, and work, and that salvation encompasses all of flesh, all of creation. The romantics, for all their diversity, join that challenge and call. They are deeply, seriously, poetically, passionately concerned with the absolute, the unconditioned, that which no thing can grasp, but which is the productive source of all that is, but they also see it expressed, encountered, and transfigured 
in the flesh and fur, soil and stamen of our nature. I suggest that philosophy of religion needs to take this living expression of the infinite in the finite as central to its ongoing task. The divine is not in a separate level of reality. That would be to make it another limited and conditioned thing. But it encounters us in and through what Norman Wurzbach calls the meshwork of the world, in which our kinship with plants and animals is unavoidable. For philosophical reasons, as much as for ethical ones, we're reminded that philosophy of religion in the future will be ecological, or it will be nothing. So I will end with a romantic, talking more explicitly about religion. Friedrich Schleiermacher, in the second of his speeches on religion, says this. The universe is ceaselessly active and at every moment is revealing itself to us. Every form it has produced, everything to which from the fullness of its life it has given a separate existence. Every occurrence scattered from its fertile bosom is an operation of the universe upon us. Now, religion is to take up into our lives and to submit to be swayed by them, each of these influences and their consequent emotions, not by themselves, but as part of the whole, not as limited and in opposition to other things, but as an exhibition of the infinite in our life. Here's to the romantic in all of us. Thank you. I'm going to invite the Head of Theology, Professor Peter McGrail, to please come forward and give us a vote of thanks. You've had the lecture, we've had the viva, now the judgment. <laughs> Thank you, Vice Chancellor. Professor Shakespeare opened his lecture with a confession and he concluded it with a toast. Here's to the romantic, he said, in all of us. In the same spirit, permit me to make a confession. I have spent decades trying to drive out the romantic from me. <laughs> the Sturm und Drang of adolescence found a perfect reflection, not in romantic poetry or philosophy, but in its musical counterpart. So if I recall my sixth form and university years, the memories play out against the sonic background of the likes of the late Beethoven, Schumann, Liszt, and above all, and most intoxicatingly, Richard Wagner. Three complete ring cycles and far, far too much Tristan und Isolde later, I suppose I would like to believe that I now breathe the purer, fresher air of Bach and Mozart and Haydn liberally seasoned with the delicious wit of Cole Porter. All much more rational, more sensible, less romantic. And yet, few things even today can evoke in me a sense of wonder before the vastness of nature as the opening bars of Das Rheingold. While I still find large sections of the outer acts of Die Valkura heartbreakingly beautiful. Meanwhile, too. Despite all that I know about it in my head, the central act of Parsifal still seduces me into Klingsor's magic garden of sensual delight, even though I know I shouldn't go there. You see, as hard as one may, it probably is impossible to exercise the romantic that lies within each of us. And with that recognition, there also enters a lingering suspicion that surely we ought to be more rational, less driven by fragmentary shards of experience, as you put it. The weight of the 18th century enlightenment still bears down upon our minds today. And we, who prize our unified cosmology and raise fine arguments, may indeed be running the risk of falling into good, old-fashioned dualisms. 
there was a chilling line about a third of the way into your lecture today. For those of us who are currently preparing exam papers, it's all right, Vice Chancellor, I'm not given to give anything away to the students. Sorry. But what exactly are we academics doing when we re constantly and relentlessly demand analysis of our students? Is that really sufficient? Or, as Professor Shakespeare has asked, are we in fact encouraging our students to understand complex living holes? Possibly not. Is analysis really a sufficient tool to measure out success, at least in the humanities, though I dare say also in education? Indeed, is it not fair to suggest that an undercurrent of this evening's lecture was an invitation to critique our pedagogy. As Professor Shakespeare reminded us, 19th century romanticism arose as a reaction against and a response to the rationalism of the previous century, and particularly against, though strangely with, Kant. He did argue that the engagement of the romantics with the philosopher of Königsberg was complex rejecting his proposal of the unknowability of the unconditioned, whilst grasping and pushing forward Kant's idea of the organism. And the result was an organic concept of nature which points away beyond the dualism of mind and body. In that way, as Professor Shakespeare suggested, the philosophical enterprise becomes a spiritual endeavor. It concerns, he said, our capacity for wonder our capacity to encounter and to love that which is genuinely other. The turn to the ecological was hinted at several times in the lecture, and Professor Shakespeare was clearly crescendoing towards it, if you allow me a return to a musical frame of mind. But when that final movement climax arrived, it was quite shocking. We might have expected a warm embrace of all things green, but instead we were brought up sharp against the dark side of ecology. Above all the risks that high sounding appeals to ecology might themselves mask questions of inequality, power, and limited access to resources. The grim mention of a Nazi inspired eco fascism drew me back to Wagner whose gross racial ideas lay beneath the veneer of his gorgeous music. Romanticism, as Professor Shakespeare reminded us, is capable of a destructive naivety. But nonetheless, I am drawn to his appeal to the entanglement, as he put it, of nature and human agency, or freedom, such that the one is the expression and the flowering of the other. That vision is truly organic, in which true freedom arises not from the exaltation of the individual, but in a mutual creativity that extends beyond the human and into our entire relationship with the cosmos. Professor Shakespeare's contention that the Western consumerist notion of freedom is thin certainly resonates. Now that idea, and much else of what has been said today echoes, I think, the thought of Pope Francis. He insists that theology is a profoundly ecological enterprise. Professor Shakespeare adds that the same, too, is true of much philosophy. If romanticism makes that bridging possible, then maybe it is time that I finally and reluctantly admit to being a romantic myself. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor McGrail. Professor Shakespeare, would you please uh, accept this as a little memento of our evening and this special evening uh, in your life, but certainly in the universities. Thank you Just a little much. token of appreciation and congratulations on a fine lecture. Thank you very much and for bringing us all together.
My friends, thank you very much for coming and joining us this evening. I'm going to ask, now with all the COVID restrictions, masks on, I'm going to ask Professor Shakespeare to go and meet you at the door and so that you can greet him. And if you could keep your masks on just in case, let's take every precaution. Thank you very much. Good evening. <laughs>